Let's see. The fencing around the federal courthouse is coming down. The Apple store is back open, and the umbrella man has his, well, his umbrella again. Portland is back. Don't call it a comeback. Well, you know, it's a start at least. And yeah, apparently it's art tax time again. The $35 bill from the city that no one ever wants to pay, especially after the year we've had. And I know a lot of people want to get rid of that twice a year time change we do, but Matt Zafino has a different perspective for you. Here's the story. I'm ready for the clocks to change. I'm excited. Finally, the clock on my car will be right again. It's only right half the year. It's about to be right again. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hi. Welcome to the story. This is a Wednesday. We appreciate you being here with us. All the ways to communicate with us, and we do want you to talk to us at the bottom of your screen. Use that hashtag, HeyDan, on Twitter. Let's get to the big story, shall we? Uh, I'm back, first of all, right? The umbrella is back. The fence is coming down. The Apple Store is open. Now, two of these are a, a big deal for all of us. One is a big deal for me, and the other is the Apple Store. But let's start, let's start with my news and get it out of the way. I'm back. Hi, I took a long weekend. Maybe you noticed, maybe you didn't. It's because my dad got the vaccine and flew out from West Virginia to see his grandkids for the first time in a really, really, really long time. For all the families watching this right now, for all those people out there who are counting down those days to hold your grandkids again, just hold tight. You're almost there. And yes, it is as emotional and as amazing as you're imagining it's going to be. And I do want you to know that we here at The Story at KGW are still working for you every day, pressing our leaders, trying to get you that vaccine as quickly and as safely as possible. And I cannot wait for everybody to feel the same things that I felt over this past weekend. Next, the, uh, the fence. You've heard this, the fence is coming down around the courthouse downtown. You know the fence. The world knows the fence. The fence is the fence that surrounded the federal courthouse for months, and it served in function and symbolism as rioters and police clashed for weeks this summer. Police put it up to try and keep rioters from trying to set fire to the building, and it became the embodiment of the us versus them mentality that consumed political discourse over the summer. That mentality still exists, by the way, of course. I think it's graduated to some new mascots. I think the COVID masks are the, the, the thing right now. Are we still angry about masks? We're debating that, right? It doesn't matter. Because the fence is what we're talking about, and that is coming down. And this is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one that stands out came from one of the economic experts that we bring on the show from time to time, John Toponia. He's with Eco Northwest. And he told me a couple of weeks ago that true recovery, in his eyes, downtown won't start until that fence is gone. I asked him about it again today. I feel great. I mean, it's a very important step to take. Uh, I think it, it illustrates to, to, to shoppers, to tourists, uh, to downtown residents uh, that we have the confidence to sort of turn the page on what was a really challenging chapter in the city's history and always will be. Uh, but, but now, obviously, you know, we're, the activity is going to have to start to pick up, and uh, we don't want to find ourselves right back where we were last year. Uh, so, you know, the community is going to have to rally around this, uh, get downtown, and the city is obviously going to have to uh, maintain order in the in the downtown core a couple of have to's at the end there right um one big one will order remain downtown we're going to touch on that in just a minute but equally as important will people rally to support the city i think so i think they will now portland restaurants really hope that you do they've been maybe the slowest to reopen because of covid restrictions in multnomah county and on friday they're going to hit a big milestone and they're going to be able to serve at 50 percent capacity I mean, not to mention the weather's changing, the days are getting longer, though in many ways, more daylight will just shine more brightly on some of the other glaring issues downtown. Things are far from perfect. Heck, they're far from normal in a lot of ways, with city streets lined with graffiti, trash, and people who don't have a home to live in. What is the next kind of thing the average observer in the downtown area should look for as a key sign that things are starting to, to come back to normal? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, pedestrian counts and, and just 
you know, human activity uh, in the downtown uh, core uh, is going to be a very helpful sign. Uh, we do have uh, the spending from the homelessness measure that we passed last year in May is coming online, uh, middle point of this year. And, you know, as we start with that implementation, uh, we're going to have to have a, a very compassionate uh, and organized uh, improvement in unsheltered homelessness uh, in downtown and throughout the city of Portland. You remember that new tax, right? I hope you do. I hope you were part of the vote to either pass it or, or not pass it, but it did pass. And you may remember it uh, in more detail, Portland Metro, they passed this landmark and very progressive tax measure to battle the crisis of homelessness in our area. It's a tax that hits the wealthiest people who live here and the wealthiest businesses, and they hope to raise $250 million a year. Now, they're still in the planning phase to really figure out exactly what to do with all of this money, but by April, those tax dollars will start rolling in. And by July, we should start seeing what they plan to do with it. All right, what was that other, I, I wanted to talk about something else. Oh yeah, the umbrella. The umbrella is back. This is the umbrella, or more specifically, the umbrella man. It is a cool statue, it's made of bronze, and it's been standing in Pioneer Courthouse Square since the early 80s. And during the unrest over the summer, someone grabbed it and they tried to rip it down and it bent the umbrella part and they had to remove it. Well, it's back now, they fixed it, and just in time for the end of the rainy season. But beggars, beggars can't be choosers. And it got me thinking though, watching this kind of, this thing come back to normal, what about all the other statues and all the other monuments that got torn down and vandalized this summer, like the poor elk that did nothing but look cool and majestic in the parks near the courthouse, but still got spray painted and set on fire and utterly disrespected before being removed by the city and replaced with, with this, this Tim Burton annihilation nightmare version of the elk that, I don't know, honestly, probably more aptly represented the bizarro world that that block or so of downtown had become. Anyhow, the, the elk and a lot of other monuments and statues are currently being held in secret locations because that's normal. We don't know when we're going to see them again or, you know, if that fencing is going to stay down around the courthouse or if the homeless crisis will actually improve or if businesses will get busy again. We do know that more people are getting vaccinated each and every day and that protests have died down. But I have honestly stopped counting my chickens there, which does kind of have me in the mood for brunch, maybe this weekend. Anyone know a good place in the city? Speaking of statues and art for that matter, I got this email from Sharon. She said, Dan, we are all exhausted. We are all broke. We are having to decide on bills or groceries or gas. It gets pretty discouraging. So imagine my added dismay when we got our annual arts tax notification this week. Are they serious? None of us has an extra $35 right now. I'm so disgusted with our city. And of course, they threaten you if you don't pay on time. Is there any flex with this this year? So Sharon, you have some great points. Let's start, let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the basics, really. Like, what even is the arts tax? And, and where does all of that money go? So for that, let's go to our segment, The 112, where we explain stuff to the 112 people who move to Oregon every day. So Portland's arts tax helps pay for arts education in schools and gives grants to nonprofits. Most of the money is split up. They split it up among six school districts, and you guessed it, the bigger school district gets the majority of the money. The law requires schools spend that money for arts teachers and supplies for kindergartners through fifth grade. Now, back in 2014, when we looked into the kind of where this money goes, PPS received more than half of the arts tax bucket of money. PPS gets, gets about half or so. And they say it helped pay for the salaries of 85 teachers. Now, a small district like Park Rose, they get less money. And that same year, they use the arts tax money to hire three teachers. The money that doesn't go to schools goes to RACC, that's the Regional Arts and Culture Council. It gives grants to museums and organizations like the Portland Arts Museum. Now this system underwent a lot of changes last year, but most notably, the RACC stepped away from giving grants to those larger, more well-known organizations, and instead they decided to pivot it toward underrepresented communities and smaller, diverse nonprofits. And I can hear you asking me right now, what organizations have gotten this money? How much money has PPS gotten? 
recently. Um, what have they spent it on? Where's this money going? And I hear you. We hear you. We have requests in right now to the RACC and the city of Portland, and we promise we're going to get you those answers. Now, there is another elephant in the room, and it, it hasn't really been an easy financial year for a lot of people. As Sharon pointed out just a bit ago in that email, see last year the city extended the deadline to pay the arts tax because of the pandemic and because people were getting hit really hard. But so far this year, we don't know if those deadlines have been extended, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. However, you can file an exemption on the city of Portland website if you were at least 70 years old or permanently disabled by December 31st, 2020, or if you meet low income requirements set by the federal government. You can also get an exemption if your annual income is less than $1,000. And Sharon, I didn't forget about you again, all right? I'm still, I'm still trying to answer your questions because we did ask the city if there was any help coming for either a way to delay the payment or help you to pay it. And we're hoping to get that answer by tomorrow. So stay tuned, as they say in the TV biz. All right, now to everyone's favorite topic, the vaccine. Seriously, most of your emails every single night and your messages on Facebook and Twitter, they're about the vaccine, even when we're talking about something else during the show, and I get that. So, as always, we send your question to our man on the vaccine beat, Pat Doris. Let's get into these questions. Here comes the first one from Susan. I signed up to be part of the lottery for a vaccine shot at the Oregon Convention Center. Is there any way to confirm my registration? Yes, Susan, once you completed that, if you did it correctly, you should have gotten an email confirmation on that. So you might check your email and your spam filters and that kind of thing. If you did not see it, why don't you go back in, make sure you filled out all the stuff properly, and then hopefully that will trigger that email confirmation. So yes, you should have gotten a confirmation. Scott says, I'm 62 and about a year ago completed cancer treatment. Does that count as an underlying condition? Well, that's an excellent question, Scott. I asked that a couple of weeks ago to uh, some of the folks at OHA and they said, here's the deal. If you're still being treated for cancer, then it's an underlying condition. If it's declared that you're cancer free, then not so much. And I can't really tell from your question where you're at, but that's the best that I know on that. I should also say that on March 29th, everyone who's 45 and above that has some sort of underlying condition immediately becomes eligible to get the vaccine. So uh, there's that. Also, Pam wants to know, we received our first shot on February 20th, a Moderna. My question is, could we just go ahead and get the Johnson for the second shot? We're leaving on vacation at the same time our second shot is scheduled. I'm just wondering if we could be proactive by getting the single shot vaccine instead of waiting till we're leaving on vacation for that second shot? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, that comes from Pam. Uh, Pam, I have to be honest with you, I don't really know the answer to that. And I wanted to bring the question up though because I think that it's a good one for all of us to start thinking about as there's all these options and as our life starts to get back to normal, we start to do things like go on vacation. And you're right, that second uh, shot is gonna probably, if you have a decent immune system, knock you down, make you feel like you've got the flu. So do you wanna be on an airplane and feel like you've got the flu? Or maybe if you're driving, the easy solution, I'm gonna assume you're driving, just push that drive back a few days and stick with your plan. I have no idea what, it, what happens if you combine the two. They work on, uh, they have different ways to trigger your immune system. So uh, I don't know is my short answer, but my longer answer is, it's something that a lot of us are gonna be thinking about, I guess, in the months to come. And uh, no scheduling vacations when you're supposed to get a second vaccination. That's probably not a very helpful answer, but that's all I have right now. <laughs> I do hope that helps. Please keep your questions coming in. We'll try and nail down uh, some more specific answers to people like Pam about, uh, could you just go for the Johnson & Johnson? I, do, I, I like the question because it's troubling. All right, we'll move on. That's, that's what's happening in the COVID vaccine today. Pat, thank you. As always, why don't we check in with our daily numbers? So this is what we got in Oregon right now. So we do the daily vaccine check. Uh, and as of this afternoon, more than 768,000 Oregonians have gotten at least that first shot. How about this percentage? I mean, that's, that's encouraging. 18% of the population right now in Oregon with at least one shot. Let's check Washington's numbers. Now, they only update their overall numbers. What do they do it like three times a week? And this is as of yesterday, more than 1.3 million people. They've gotten at least that first dose. That's 17.3 percent of Washington's population.
Pacific Power just got hit with a couple more class action lawsuits over last summer's wildfires. And historic fires cause a lot of damage, which is why the victims want billions of dollars in damages. When the story continues. I spent most of the commercial breaks, like that one, going through my emails and Facebook comments and stuff like that to try and figure out what I can maybe talk about at the end of the show. So I'm picking a few right now. Stay tuned. Maybe I'll talk about yours as we close things out. But keep them coming at the story at KGW.com and always use that hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. So it is almost daylight saving time. I always want to say daylight savings time, but it's saving time for some reason. They want to make it even more confusing. Uh, it's everyone's favorite two Sundays of the year when our schedules get all messed up. If you're not a fan, I don't blame you. Apparently, neither is Oregon State. Senator Ron Wyden. He is actually reintroducing a bill that would make daylight saving time permanent for the entire country. It's called the Sunshine Protection Act. Now you remember uh, the entire West Coast is on board with this. Oregon, Washington, California. We all voted to stop switching clocks back and forth twice a year and to just stay on permanent daylight saving time. Kind of what we're about to go into. That's the period we're heading into this weekend actually. And we actually voted on it two years ago but Congress still needs to approve that change and Wyden said it'll give us some much needed stability if we don't have to be constantly changing our clocks back and forth and who doesn't need a little bit more stability in their lives right now let's go to Matt Safino all right um, who has an interesting take on all this because I think most people complain about it but Matt has has some points that make us kind of feel grateful for the way we do it we got him live outside right now as the the Sun is uh, is setting in downtown yeah, even without daylight saving time, Dan, it's uh, it's still light out here at 6.15 at night. I did a Facebook post on this because I wanted people to be fully informed about what it would mean if we had year-round daylight saving time. It seems like a simple thing, you know, and for you, it would mean that your clocks in your car are right all year long and not being wrong for four and a half months a year. But for a lot of people, the struggle is real. I mean, the change of the clocks can, can wreak havoc with families and kids getting to school on time, sleep patterns and all of that. So there's a lot of passion around around this issue. But again, it's not as simple as you might think. And, and there is a, 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 another side to this, which I want to point out. So let's go to the graphic right now. And what I do is I show you a comparison of year-round daylight saving time and year-round standard time, because a lot of people are saying, let's not do daylight saving time at all. Let's just stay on standard time all year long. So for January 1st, if we had daylight saving time uh, year round, we would have super late sunrises if we stayed on daylight saving time, had no standard time around the first of the year. It would be at 8.50, nearly 9 o'clock before the sun comes up in Portland around the first of the year. If we stay on standard time like we are now, that late sunset or sunrise, it's still late, it's at 7.50, but not nearly as brutal. Now let's go over to summer. Here's July. We would have super early sunrises if we had no daylight saving time, if we stayed on standard time all year long. Look at that. Our sunrise would be at 426 in the morning on July 1st. Now I know that's not what the bill is calling for, but some people have said, let's just not do daylight saving time. Let's stay on standard time. Let me show you some more on this. Sunrise with year-round daylight saving time would be after 8.30 in Portland for over two months, from November 30th to Groundhog Day, February 2nd. Conversely, sunrise, if we had year-round standard time, would be before 4.30 from late May to early July. Now, a lot of people commented and said, hey, look, there's increased traffic accidents and, and things like that around the time change, but think about the impact of having it be so dark so late in the day for a couple of months in Portland. I mean, we're talking about nine o'clock sunrises. Kids wouldn't just be waiting for the bus in the dark to go to school. They'd be in school taking classes in the dark at nine o'clock. So again, my point on this is just to give everybody, you know, complete information about what it would really mean if we stayed on daylight saving time all year long. We would have some super long, late, dark mornings in the middle of winter when our mornings are already long and dark. I don't, that, that last point you made just really sank in, how not only would kids be in the dark on the way to school, but their first class, they'd be sitting in the dark. I don't know, that, that just resonated with me for some reason. Matt, thank you. Uh, I think a lot of people also wonder, well, why don't states like Arizona and things like that have to uh, change, go through Congress to make their changes? Well, they stayed on standard time because we're looking to change it to what we're going into, daylight saving. That's why all the laws get, get into effect. But that was interesting uh, from Matt. Thank you. So last night on the story, we spent a, a pretty good chunk of the show 
looking back at last summer's historic wildfires. If you can believe it, it's already been like six months now since that Labor Day windstorm when everything just exploded and things got really, really terrible and crazy around here. Now, we updated you on this ongoing class action lawsuit that fire victims filed against Pacific Power. Well, today the company got hit with two more huge lawsuits from victims. They're basically claiming the same thing. The Pacific Power's lines were the ones that started the fires in the Santa Ana Canyon. An incident report from September says downed power lines sparked at least 13 fires in that area, which eventually merged with that massive Beachy Creek fire. Five people were killed. Thousands of homes and buildings were destroyed. Now the victims want Pacific Power to pay up here. One billion dollars in damages and they've got a law firm backing them that's dealt with this sort of thing before and gotten results. This is not a, an experience that was novel, that there have been wildfires all over the country, particularly on the West Coast, obviously, that have been started in similar instances. Um, we represent over a thousand individuals in the Camp Fire in Northern California uh, that, and brought suit against PG&E there that has resolved for um, many billions of dollars uh, for, for those individuals and businesses there. Uh, and it's similar. There are similar issues with powered lines, um, infrastructure that, that needed maintenance, um, that started a fire there that ran rampant and, and destroyed an entire town. Um, and our complaint alleges that something very similar happened and that there was the benefit of the knowledge of these other terrible tragedies that had come before it. Um, that, that Pacific Corp would have had knowledge of the experiences that PG&E went through and that the individuals in, in various fires in Northern California went through and use that knowledge to better prepare and to protect their, their customers and the residents of these areas. Now, we've reached out to Pacific Power, of course, and they told us they don't comment on pending litigation. We knew they were going to say that, but we have to ask anyway. But we're going to keep you posted on where these lawsuits go. We've also got some more information about how these victims are doing right now. You know, how are they? What are their lives like now six months later? About 4,000 people across Oregon lost their homes in these fires. 4,000 people. And a lot of them still at this point don't have anywhere to go. The State Department of Human Services says that more than 1,400 people are still in shelters. Most of those shelters are in the form of, of a hotel. But about 260 families qualified for temporary housing through FEMA, which is like, kind of like a mobile home situation. And about 100 families are actually using those right now as we speak. The state is also helping victims get food and to feed their families. They serve more than 31,000 meals to wildfire victims in the last week of February to give you an idea of where the need is right now and how it's still there in a very big way. So you can tell by these numbers, a lot of people are still hurting. All right, keep sending in your questions and your comments, your complaints, your snail mail. I read it all. Follow me on, on Facebook. I'm always opening up mail on there. It's fun. Uh, whatever you want, though. Use that hashtag, hey, Dan. I'm going to read a few of your comments as we finish the story right after this. All right, let's talk comments. People using the hashtag, hey, Dan. Paul did so on Twitter. I did this segment off the top talking about how the umbrella is back in the hands of Umbrella Man, that bronze statue in downtown. And uh, I said, right in time for the end of the rainy season. And Paul said, hey, Dan, we still have about three months to go in the rainy season. Hey, come on, man. Don't rain on my parade, Paul. Uh, how about this one? I was asking for brunch recommendations for this weekend. I didn't get nearly as many as I thought. I know nobody's been out to brunch in like forever, but I'm thinking about it this weekend. Susan said Cafe Nell. I'll look it up. I'll give it a look. Um, Dan McLean said, what about, what do we know about the next free day at the art museum? Well, I know last time I checked in with the art museum, they weren't considering free days. They were talking about ways to keep the doors open and to bring money in. But it's funny you said that because I was looking to check in with them and see how the arts community is doing right now and, and what the future looks like for the great art in this city. Um, and then my favorite from James Young Live Got tonight, he said, hey Dan, humans are the only animals that have clocks. None of the other animals care about daylight saving time. That's true, we probably lost a lot of dog viewers tonight. And I would also say, I'm gonna use that argument next time I like show up late for work, I'm gonna be like, boss, humans are the only animals that care about time. Come on. I'll let you know how it works out. That's the story. I'll see you tomorrow at six or, you know, whenever.